Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Vlog, and this week we're presenting Carnage Week. Even though we have a lot of movie news coming up, I definitely wanted to talk more about uh, Carnage Classic, because that was a trade paperback that we mentioned the origin of Cletus Cassidy in, but there's still some more stories in there. It's a very dense book. There's a lot of, like, one-shots and, you know, mini-series and things all collected in Carnage Classic. So if you haven't picked it up yet, I highly recommend getting it either on Kindle or Comixology for really cheap, or you can get it at your local comic store. I believe it's still in print. So uh, if Marvel, if you're out there, keep it in print. It's an awesome book and there's a lot of stories we got to cover. So in this episode, we're going to take a look at three one shots. Uh, there's three one issue storylines that are in this graphic novel that I think are worth mentioning. And they have, some of them have ties that link them all together. Uh, not all like a single story straight through, but just threads in each one that get picked up by the different writers. And it's really awesome. Uh, so the three writers we have in this are David Michelini, Warren Ellis and David Quinn. And David Quinn was nice enough to write me back and say that he would uh, be interested in doing an interview. I sent him the questions, so we'll definitely peel back the layers of one of these stories a little bit more with him later on. So we'll just kind of brush over these three stories as quickly as we can, and just so I can give you the information of the storylines that these, uh, these books present. So in the first uh, book we're gonna go over, it's actually Amazing Spider-Man Annual number 28. And this was like a giant annual size. So annuals are basically comics that come out once a year, and uh, they tie into the main storylines, uh, but also have like, you know, they tell one and done stories as we call them. Uh, so Amazing Spider-Man, it has the, the brand Amazing Spider-Man on it, and it's part of that collection of books, but it typically will go off in another direction and get new writers uh, or current writers to do something that is exclusive to that issue. And that's no exception here. We have David Michelini telling a Carnage story, and this is actually the first time Spider-Man has to fight Carnage on his own. It's one on one. But you have Carnage uh, opening up this storyline and he's uh, in, you know, the vault again. And it's just like last time, only this time they know if they draw blood, it'll awaken Carnage. So this time he's strapped up. His arms are nowhere near each other. His fingers are spread out. His uh, feet are planted on this, uh, you know, ground area. It's like, it's like a base uh, thing that's uh, with a big chair and he's like hooked into it like this. And, uh, and everything's separated, so he can't, like, scratch himself or cut himself. He's got this, like, uh, you know, gag in his mouth to prevent him from biting down on his tongue to awaken Carnage that way. And he's got this electric field around him uh, trying to keep him in place in case something breaks out or he gets out uh, because they believe electricity will, electricity will hurt him. Uh, but they, they're using this, like, uh, unique energy field around him to try to keep him in there. Uh, they should have learned, and they will later, to use microwave uh, beams on him because that kind of heat temperature uh, hurts him a lot. Uh, so he has a little bit slightly of a different weakness than uh, than Venom in that way. But uh, so yeah, so they, they don't know all this yet. They're still learning about this guy. So there's this energy field around him and he's strapped up and uh, and he's smiling at them. He's laughing. He's And he's got the, the gag in his mouth and he's just biting really hard on that gag. And finally it splits his lip and boom, carnage comes out. Uh, there is just no keeping this guy down. Unless he's knocked unconscious, he is coming back and he's coming back strong. So in this issue, he breaks out, he goes off on this, you know, um, basically single-minded, uh, you know, mission. He's been doing chaos, he's all about chaos. And in the first two times we see him, he's all about bringing chaos to everything. This time, he's doing the opposite. Everyone expects him now to do, to bring chaos and to just go nuts and do some big splatter house, you know, kill everybody in the city kind of thing. So this time he's actually going to kill one person to alleviate, uh, you know, uh, you know, deviate from expectation. He's trying to go uh, right. When everyone thinks he's going to zig, he zags. And uh, that's really interesting. And it shows him, he even explains, I'm doing it on purpose. I'm coming after this one person because everyone expects me to go do the opposite. So no one's going to expect me to come here and find this person. This one person who has a link to my past. And what we learn is Cletus Cassidy, when he was a kid, actually had a best friend. Uh, when he went to camp, he uh, tried to start like a fire in a, a nearby camp house with, uh, with all these like young girls and kids that were there sleeping, trying to go to sleep. And he set off like this big bad prank that could have hurt and killed all of them. And, uh, and then luckily it was stopped in time and, and everyone, you know, the camp counselors came together and they're like, all right, we, we, you know, put a stop to this. No one got hurt, but we need to punish the person who's responsible. And uh, when they were making their way over to Cletus, this kid named Billy, uh, stepped up and Billy was like, uh, yeah, I was the one who did it. And the teacher was like, all right, you're in trouble. And he basically took the, the blame for Cletus's actions. And Cletus looked at him and was like, wow, no one's ever done something like that for me before. Uh, why'd you do it? And then Billy was like, I don't know. I thought we were friends, you know, like, like they both are kind of like, felt like outsiders at this camp. 
and Cletus is like, wow, I never had a friend. Like, cool, thanks. And you can see maybe there's maybe there would have been a time in Cletus's life where he could have went a different route. That was probably the only moment. So Billy is very pivotal to uh, Carnage's growth because what happens is they, even though they were friends, uh, nothing Billy could do stopped Cletus from doing this bad stuff. And they were on this like a retreat from the, uh, the, the the school for boys and stuff. So they were sent to this camp along with other kids. And some of them were bad kids, some of them were good kids. And uh, that was kind of the only time they got to hang out and be around each other. So they developed a friendship over that summer. And since, you know, Billy didn't stick around and they didn't grow up friends together, um, you know, he, he went on his evil ways. Uh, Cletus went on his evil ways. So now that he's grown up, he is after Billy and he wants to kill Billy uh, and so it's kill Bill time and he goes after Bill and uh, and finds out that Billy is not the good person that Billy you know thought he would become he grew up he got married he had kids uh, but when we meet Billy in the story he's on the verge of divorce he also lost a lot of money he got a trip to Las Vegas from his company that he's working for and they sent him on a fully paid vacation to Vegas and while there he developed a gambling problem and he came home and it ruined his family life. It got him in a lot of debt, and he just kept getting worse and worse and worse. So now he's running this uh, company in the Rocky Mountains up in Colorado, this like lumber company, and he's about to steal all of the savings from the safe and just go to Mexico because his life's in shambles. He owes a lot of people money. Some people might even come and try to kill him. So he's like, all right, I screwed up, and I'm going to run away from my problems and just go you know, somewhere where uh, no one will find me. And, uh, and so he's ready to run away. Well, Carnage shows up and says, you know, it took me some time to track you down, but I, I broke out and I, I got gotcha. you. And I'm, I'm here to kill you. And, and he explains, I'm here to kill you because everyone expects me to go paint the town red in New York, but I'm over here doing this. And he goes, oh, this is something personal for me and no one's expecting it. So no one's gonna come find you. No one's gonna, you know, find your dead body. Uh, no one's gonna save you. Uh, but little did he know, Spider-Man actually put a tracker because Cletus Cassidy stole a cop car to drive out there and Spider-Man put a tracker on the car. And, uh, you know, for Cletus Cassidy wanted to keep a low profile, he didn't do a good job by stealing a cop car, but either way, it gave Spider-Man the opportunity to put a tracer on him, and Spider-Man was able to trace him to the city that he was in in Colorado. And then Spider-Man's swinging around and sees some, you know, commotion going on over at the lumber yard and runs over there and saves uh, Billy just in time. And as him and Carnage are fighting, uh, Billy starts to run away, and he runs into the room where the, the money was, and he's like, all right, just grab the money and go. Just grab the money and go. And what Billy decides to do instead is he ends up uh, facing his past and facing uh, what he's done wrong and choosing not to be like Cletus Cassidy. He says, I could run, but that's what Cleet would do. My, my best friend Cleet, when we were kids, he would run away. Uh, so I'm not going to go do that. I'm going to go and do the right thing. I'm going to be like Spider-Man. And so he goes and steps up to uh, Carnage and says, come on, come at me. Like, if you want to kill me, do it. But meanwhile, he's just he knows he's just a distraction. He sees Spider-Man like, you know, coming to after he got knocked out. He sees him in the background coming to and uh, Spider-Man comes in and gets the winning blow because Billy says, look, I, I know Carnage can kill me, but I'm telling you, if you turn into Cletus, my friend Cleet, there's no way the man I knew, the kid I knew when we were best friends, no way would that kid kill me. And Cletus Cassidy's like, yeah, dude, I'm psychotic now. I'm totally going to kill you. So he reverts the Carnage suit back inside of him, makes himself 100% vulnerable, and Spider-Man comes and knocks him out. Uh, and then, of course, they re-arrest him and send him off. Uh, but then at the end of the story, you know, Billy says, you know, Spider-Man's like, why didn't you run? I told you to run. And Billy says, because, you know, he was a monster that maybe I had a part in creating. And I wanted to face my fears. And this has now made me realize what I should do with my life. And I'm going to face my fears of my personal life and not run away. So at the end of the, the you know story, Billy doesn't take the money and run. He actually goes back inside and uh, and resigns from his job, hands the company over to someone who's capable of running it, who might not steal from it, and then goes and joins uh, Gamblers Anonymous and tries to get the help that he needs. So it's a really great story. If you haven't uh, you know checked it out, it's awesome. It's in Spider-Man Annual, Amazing Spider-Man Annual 28, but it can be found in classic uh, in this graphic novel called Carnage Classics. The next two storylines we're going to talk about, we're going to kind of weave together. Uh, we have the first one is called Mind Bomb, and it's written by Warren Ellis, and it's drawn by Kyle Hotz. And uh, Kyle Hotz also draws the next story called Carnage, It's a Wonderful Life, which is written by David Quinn. Uh, and the art is great. Like, it's really creepy, really demented. In the first story, we have Carnage back at Ravencroft. Uh, now he's under the care of Dr. Ashley Kafka, and Ashley Kafka is really trying to um, break through to him. She is trying so hard. She's tried everything to reach the man inside and try to save 
any goodness that is inside Cletus Cassidy. Uh, and hopefully that goodness will be strong enough to purge the Carnage symbiote. But every time she's tried, she couldn't do it. So they hire an outside consultant and working for her as her head of security is John Jameson, J. Jonah Jameson's son. Uh, so he plays a big part in Carnage's storyline from here on out because then this carries on into even nowadays. This came out in like the mid 90s, uh, but this storyline, these storylines were like mid to late 90s. And even still to today with uh, Jerry Conway writing the current uh, current Carnage run, you still have John Jameson involved. Uh, so it's really cool that these are the breadcrumbs that lead to the current series. And I love when writers go back and look at the threads and say, who, which characters were working together to stop Carnage back then and bringing them back to, you know, modern day and bringing them back. So. I like that they're doing that and they kept the continuity going. Uh, so yeah, in this storyline in Mind Bomb, you have this specialist coming in and he's like a real psychotic dude. He's big on torture and he's been able to crack the most psychotic of people out there by being a psychopath himself. And uh, it's, you know, most people don't like his methods and, you know, and Ashley Kafka doesn't even fully want him there, but people over her are like, we need to make some progress with Carnage or else he's gonna get out and he's gonna kill people again. So we gotta do something. Uh, and so this specialist comes in and starts probing the mind of Cletus Cassidy. He injects him with vitamin C and like an extra concoction to like twist his mind a little bit. And he's overstimulating Cletus's mind so that the carnage symbiote can't bond with it. So it's just kind of like twitching in the corner chaotically. And I was like, wow, that's a pretty inventive way to dispatch the symbiote uh, briefly. Uh, but of course it doesn't last. And carnage regains, uh, you know, Cletus regains uh, uh, control of the carnage symbiote and then uses it to uh, insert uh, a blade like he turns his hand into a blade the blade comes out like a like a you know rope and goes into the head of the specialist and uh, and he's able to imprint psychotic thoughts and you learn a new power that carnage has and he's able to drive someone crazy by going into their mind and, and infecting them with some of his symbiote and uh, and this guy loses mind takes off all of his clothes and starts eating a guard like a guard comes in is like what's happening and he bites into the guard's neck and just starts biting into him over and over and over. And then another guard shows up and has to put you know, the specialist down. Uh, so now Ashley Kafka has a dead specialist on her hands and an inmate that's about to break out. And luckily her and John and another guard are able to reseal the door and keep Carnage in his cell uh, with microwave emitters and other things you know, active to keep him in there. So uh, yeah, at this point they started to learn how to contain him. Uh, but again, they kept trying to cure him of his of his uh mental psychoticness you know his his rage and his anger towards people and once again they fail and this actually has some threads that pick up in the next story called it's a wonderful life which again has the same artist kyle hotz but a different writer uh, and david quinn wrote a really neat story where it's carnage basically uh sitting in his cell and ashley and you know and and john jameson have 24 hours left before ravencroft is shut down their funding is cut and uh, Carnage is taken away to a new facility, uh, probably a government facility where they're gonna do Lord knows what to him. So she has her last chance, Ashley Kafka has her last chance to break through and find the goodness in Cletus. So she teams up with John Jameson and they uh, work out this machine that uh, sends them inside uh, Cletus's mind. So it's kind of like that movie, um, The Cell. Uh, only, of course, Cletus takes over, you know, tears everything apart and then injects his tentacles into them and brings them into the world he wants them to see. And so now they're completely under his control in his mind. And while they're in there, he's turning them into monsters themselves. And he turns Ashley into like a roach creature lady. And he turns uh, John Jameson into his alter ego, the man wolf, who is, you know, that happened in the comic books uh, where I think it was in the 70s, and maybe the 60s too, where John Jameson got like this weird amulet and he turned into a werewolf guy called the man wolf. Uh, so he turns into Man Wolf again. So that was cool that they brought back that storyline and tied it into this. And uh, and again, just David Quinn taking up all these threads from these other stories and writing them in his. Because what happens is as they're moving through Cletus's mind, trying to find the goodness in him, Ashley finally comes across it. So, you know, uh, John Jameson quickly turns to the monster side. He almost immediately embraces the Man Wolf. But Ashley fights like her animal side, like her roach side that she's turning into. She fights it as hard as she can. She's still trying to be the good person that she is. And she makes her way into the center of Cletus Cassidy's mind and she finds Billy. And she finds Billy from the annual storyline. And Billy's a little kid and he's, he's like, where's Cleet? Where's my best friend? And she's like, I'll help you find him. I'll help you find him. And they go off to try to find little boy Cletus Cassidy to try to send him on a different path. And reroute his mind to become a better person. Uh, sadly though, this doesn't work. 
and uh, and Ashley is forced to use Billy as bait in a way uh, to lure Cletus in. And when she, her and John finally spring their trap to awaken the goodness inside Cletus, it doesn't really work. And Cletus threatens to kill Billy, but then before that happens, uh, you know, which Billy's the representation of his good side, uh, before that happens, you know, they get out of the machine and Carnage goes into like a uh, slightly comatose state temporarily. Uh, and then so do, you know, Ashley and John. So everything gets interrupted. And when they wake up, John and Ashley, they see that the, the funding, you know, the building is, it's a couple hours have passed. Uh, Cletus is being escorted out by this new group that's going to take uh, over him and study him. And her and John are left wondering what's, you know, what's going to happen. And meanwhile, the sign for, you know, Ravencroft being closed is being put up and uh, their funding is getting cut and she ran out of time. Her 24 hours are up and now Cletus is going off. And, uh, and so that's where this story kind of leaves you. Uh, with Cletus, you know, still gathering his thoughts and Ashley still feeling uh, a part of him inside of her, uh, but hoping that there's still a part of that, you know, Billy and, and the young Cletus Cassidy goodness inside Carnage as he's being taken away. Uh, so it's really cool stuff. These three one shots were really awesome. And I think they tell a lot about this character of Carnage, but also give a great look at characters like John Jameson and Ashley Kafka. And John Jameson will come back later. We'll talk more about him later in a, co a comic book called Carnage, The One That Got Away. And of course, that's referencing this storyline. Uh, that book is written by Jerry Conway. That is the, you know, the most recent Carnage ongoing series that they did. And that's volume one. And they're talking in that one. It's basically John Jameson and Eddie Brock and a team going after Carnage. And uh, and this is kind of why is because John Jameson couldn't stop him here on this day. So now he takes responsibility and tries to take him down later on. It's really good stuff, and I hope you guys like it. If you want to read these stories, pick up Carnage Classics today, either on Kindle uh, or Comicsology, or if you have a local comic store near you, go visit them contribute to them, have them order the book for you. It's freaking awesome. Let me know what you think of this down in the comments below. If you've read any of these, let me know if you have any favorite moments. And like I said, I'll try to get David Quinn on here either in person and record him uh, or, you know, get like a, a email interview, something, whatever I can work out. And we'll peel back the layers and try to dissect uh, some of the things he put into the It's a Wonderful Life storyline. And we can flesh that out a little bit more and I'll have more to talk to you guys about it. So thank you so much for watching. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. I'll see you in the future. Peace.